Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 54. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, so they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So, give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day, otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by, to, by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. We're continuing our meditation today, this Good Friday, on four men and three crosses. And by the end of that first Good Friday, it definitely looked as if Barabbas had won and Jesus had lost. Barabbas lived and Jesus was dead. But the story doesn't end there. There was no script for what happened next. And history is measured now from a different standpoint. A standpoint from which far from Barabbas being the apparent victor, he becomes a mere footnote for something much greater is happening. Today is still Good Friday. Well, at least it's Friday. While people drew away from the scene, beating their breasts, one bystander, a centurion, so a senior soldier responsible for a hundred soldiers, declared, surely this was a righteous man. And another group of people stood at a distance watching these things says the scripture. Now these were people who had known Jesus. They included some of the women who had followed him from Galilee, maybe Mary, Jesus' mother, maybe Mary's sister, Salome, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, or maybe Mary, the wife of Clopas, or maybe Mary Magdalene. These were women who had ministered to Jesus before in various ways. You read about it in Luke chapter 8. But who were the other people? Maybe John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Jesus had sp certainly spoken to him from the cross. We read that in John chapter 19. I wonder if there were any other of the 11 present. I wonder if Joseph of Arimathea was present, or, or Nicodemus. Why were they standing 
at a distance. Some of them, evidently, according to John chapter 19, had earlier been standing closer to the cross. And now perhaps they felt themselves to be in danger. But one thing was clear. They were watching. They were to become important witnesses of the events that were taking place. Now, I want you to pause for a few moments and ask yourself this question. Where would you prefer to stand? Would you be curious and wander past, but sufficiently closely to take a good long look at what was happening? Or would you prefer to stand well away, just far enough to catch a glimpse, but with the desire to move away as quickly and as inconspicuously as you can? Why? I suggest you pause on that question for a few moments. It would be worth just pressing the pause button and imagining yourself as part of that scene and trying to answer this question. Where would you prefer to stand? Curious? You wander past, but you're sufficiently close to have a good long look. Or would you prefer to just stand well away? just far enough to catch a glimpse, but with a desire to move away as quickly and as inconspicuously as you can. Why? Pause and think about that for a few moments. And then I wonder, what about Barabbas? Maybe he'd run a long way off by this time, but maybe not. I wonder, was he one of the ones that might have been watching from some distant vantage point? If that was so, or if words subsequently came to him about what had happened, he must have been rocked to the very core. He would certainly have a unique perspective of what Jesus had done as a substitute for him. And given what he had experienced and witnessed, and the relief and the release that must have flooded into his heart, I wonder if Barabbas ever repented of the wrong he'd done. I wonder if he ever asked to be forgiven. Actually, tradition suggests not, but rather that he continued with his lawlessness and he led another rebellion for which he was later put to death. But the record leaves those questions unanswered. And Jesus' broken body was gently removed for burial. Joseph of Arimathea was a distinguished highly respected member of the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, who had not been party to the decision to put Jesus to death. And he came forward and he asked Pilate for permission to remove the body. Now, according to Roman law, those condemned to death had lost their right to be buried. And so Joseph's request was not without risk. And of course, Pilate hated the Jews. So this took real courage. But nevertheless, the body was handed over to this secret disciple, took it down from the cross, probably with some assistance from Nicodemus and perhaps some other servant and then in accordance with the burial custom of the Jews, they wrapped the body in a linen cloth and they lay it in a new tomb. And they sealed that tomb with a heavy, huge stone. 
It was, of course, still Friday. And so the women went home and prepared spices and perfumes, intending to return after the Sabbath, the Saturday. And after 6 p.m., bazaars and the spice markets would be open again, and so they would be preparing for a visit to the tomb early the next morning. And that is where we end our reflection for today, Good Friday. But we know that the story did not end there. We know it didn't end when Jesus' body was laid in the cold, dark tomb with its entrance sealed. By this time, of course, Barabbas was a footnote. I can't help wondering what went through his mind when he heard of subsequent events, but that's not for today. His substitute lay in the grave, dead. And right now, both were seemingly written out of history. But not quite. Because from this side of history, we understand that something far greater was happening on that day of crucifixion. When Jesus took upon himself the penalty of sin, not just on behalf of Barabbas, but on behalf of the whole human race, God in Jesus Christ, thus reconciling the world unto himself. And when you and I turn to him in repentance and faith, that substitutionary death of Jesus Christ secures my immunity from judgment because he bore on the cross the penalty, which wasn't just Barabbas due, but it was my due too. So I am going to invite you just to ponder for a while and answer this question. We've talked about where you might have stood in relation to the cross when Jesus was being crucified. But having heard the full story of why he was crucified, ask yourself, where do I now stand? What does it all mean to me? And there's a question for you to consider in this next hour. Where do you now stand? What does it all mean to you? Have you considered the possibility that Jesus died as a substitute for your sins and for my sins? In that act of substitutionary sacrifice, God deliberately took the lostness of humanity and carried it upon himself in the person of his son, suffering even to the point of death, so that we, you and me, and not just Barabbas, so that we might live. It's small surprise, you know, that St. Paul says, and prays actually, to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. And he concludes with these words in Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the knowledge and the wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. We're going to pray again. And you'll be able to listen to some music. Can I say this, that if you've realised perhaps for the very first time that Jesus died for all humankind, and therefore for you and for me, and if you'd like to say a simple prayer of thankfulness at the end of these meditations, to give thanks to him and to commit or to rededicate your life to him, then there will be an opportunity to respond as we reach the end 
of these three hours of reflection and meditation. So when we come back about 2.50, there will be that opportunity. For the time being, I invite you to reflect on this question again. Given all you've heard, where do you now stand in relation to Jesus? And what does it all mean to you? Struggling, coping with time stained by hurt, despairing, parted from love and the loved. But love doesn't lose heart, personified in the courage of those willing to care for his burial, demonstrated by those ready to anoint his body, the culmination of their love as they watched and waited. Love was watching. Love was waiting. Love personified in the sacrifice of the one willing to die that I might live. Love flowing from the one ready to anoint me with forgiveness, the sanctification of pure, costly love, revealed in God the Father through God the Son. Wherever I find myself, Lord, I am free to seek your love. Wherever I stand, Lord, I am free to acknowledge your sacrifice. Wherever I am, Lord, I can watch, wait, and pray. You did this, Lord, for me.
As we come to the close of this Good Friday meditation, let us remind ourselves of the words of St. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. He said, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, as I contemplate what you did for me at the cross, I give you my thanks. As I realize that you are my substitute, you substituted yourself for my sins. I surrender my life to you. I give you my all, for I am in all with you. Take me and use me, I pray, for your glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.